So I'm going to take you back to your statement about all neighborhoods uh, taking growth. Yeah. One of the things that we I said actually the nuance. Well, I just want to say all neighborhoods taking affordability. Yes, yes. That's a new No, and that's fine. Yeah. The problem we have seen with the comp plan over 20 years is where they set targets, then they step back and they say, but we can't enforce. It's you know there's people who own land, and the city has development capacity that can't get unlocked. So this is sort of magical thinking to just say, the market will take care of it. How will you, as now you've gone from master planner to master director, how will you actually enact this? OK, so the question was, how do you actually, So, and I want to make it really clear that I didn't say, uh, I, I, I said affordability, tar, uh, afford, every community has to take on affordability. And I did that on purpose, because I believe that every community has to have housing diversity, economic diversity in it. And so the way you do that is you do have to set, plan, you do have to make a plan because a plan allows us to hold ourselves accountable. I mean, that's the bottom line. But you also then have to have a willingness to implement the plan. And I believe that the city has a really important role, as do neighborhood community groups and the private development community. And so, for example, as I was saying around surplus property, there are some places in town that have surplus property available. And we need to be working with communities, and that's a place where the city can put resources, literal technical planning, uh, money resources, into making those projects come to fruition, working with other partners. Another thing I think would be really interesting is what if we gave neighborhood councils some planning dollars to work themselves on how do you accommodate affordability based on what our goals are in your neighborhood, based on what your neighborhoods need. And that, you know, the goal would be that would have to be a... I'm just saying, yeah, go ahead, push that, back. That's that is fine. the magical thinking, right? Plans don't mean anything without the force of the Seattle Municipal Code behind it that says you must sell this land or transform this land or enforce developers to comply with the targets of the area. It's so a, that, so I would say that that's industry. part of it. That, I mean, that is part of it. You do have to make sure that your, your zoning and your land use choices are, are making sense. But you also have to make sure that you are doing all of those other things. Our conversation around affordability has been around zoning. That is a piece of it. But if we are truly going to address affordability in this city, we need to open up all of those other tools that I've been talking about. And the city has to be doing that. The city so, says there are no tools. That's what I'm trying well, to Well, I just, I threw out a few. I mean, and let me, actually, let me put another tool on the table. So in the middle of 2015, we passed a big transportation package. And there was a really lousy compromise that was going to take $500 million out of our community and send it to the state. I forced an amendment to keep that money in our region. That's $500 million. It was written to be flexible, to support low-income youth. We could use that money to house and support children to keep them near their schools. That's a large population in the city of families who are homeless or housing vulnerable. And, and that money is flexible. We literally could use that for rental vouchers. So that's another tool. And you don't know about that because that was one of those things that happened in Olympia in the middle of the night that doesn't get reported. But that's a resource that we have coming to our community in 2020. Thank you. Yeah, uh, blah, blah, blah is very important. I live in the city for 30 years. Yeah. And I don't understand why for 30 years we always elect mayor for political crook and make condition worse, worse, and worse. So, it don't go better, never, for 30 years. So my question to you, is this because Seattle is a morally degenerate idiot or something different? What is your opinion? My opinion is fundamentally different. And I mean, I believe deeply in, oh yes. Oh, uh, I think the question was, is it, and I'm gonna paraphrase. Is it, no, 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 I don't think that's necessary. I'll, I'll summarize, thank you. So summarizing, is it maybe idiocy to think that we can actually change things or do I disagree? And I will tell you, I deeply believe in a progressive notion of government, which is that government has a role in making our lives better, whether it is delivering public education, whether it is delivering public infrastructure projects like light rail, whether it is environmental and labor protection. I believe deeply in that. And I also believe that it isn't our job to finish the task in a particular mayoral uh, four-year term but that it is all of our job to spend time doing that piece by piece, let's make it a little better. And if I could spend four years 
addressing the homelessness crisis and making it better, that would, would have been four years well spent. Uh, okay. This for 30 years, same what as you talking. For 30 years, everybody yes. talking about Yes, sir. Oh, pardon, ma'am. Thank you. Yes, uh, my name is Marjorie. This is a fascism. And I was born and raised in Seattle, Washington. Real loud, no mic. Can you hear me? No. 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 Okay, because they tell me I'm used to yelling. There's no <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm going to let you hear me for real. <laughs> my name is Marguerite Richard, and I was born and raised in Seattle, Washington. And I do agree that the Bertha Landis room can be used for better things other than letting people come up in there disabled and have those guards coming up in there touching them and having them escorted out and ending up being trespassed, okay? That's an illegal act right now that we have against the city of Seattle. So you're running for mayor. I keep some, in other words, I know when I came in here, all I had to do was know that Alex Zimmerman was in the room and everybody was ah, like a bunch of sharks. And that's the way I feel like people have been towards our community, black people. And I must use as example, uh, this here is called Northwest Master William Cumming. They had a little art uh, show with a reception down there at 1201 Western Avenue. Don't you know I walked in there because the a, a car was on the outside. I said, oh, let me go in there. I was the only black person that was in there throughout the whole night. But this man, he was black. Y'all want to pass it around? This the artist that's dead now. Okay, they was exhibiting his art on the wall, but no presence of us in the building. So that's what I'm saying. And I went to something else. I can't, you, you, you only got two minutes like they do down there at City Hall. It, it, I'm telling you what they do. No, the question is the fact that the Bertha Landis room, Alex Zimmerman being the subject of disarray every time when I come in the presence of where he's at, it's either some kind of shark attack on him, and that's the kind of shark attack they use on black people in this community, which is now being gentrified. Let's see that detail, though, right. this let, let it go ahead and talk. Yeah. Then the artwork is an no, example of going curve. to an outing where everybody else is in the room that don't look like me, but they're displaying this art thing that I was showing you. Yeah, he got it. You got it like that. Yes, and that's why I am raising my boys now because I am sick and tired of being sick and tired in a place that I was born and raised in. Amen. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. Next. And so, uh, yes. I can respond. Thank you. I, I, Thank mean, you. I think that the question that's being, the point that's being raised is really important, and that is that the black community in this um, city is being displaced, and that it is a, and well, that you there are- support room or not? I didn't understand. What was that? Say that again. You support open Bertha room for free election for everybody, not only for you. Um, I would have to learn a little bit more about that. But here, but let me get back to the issue. So, as I mean, there are development questions happening in this community right now, and land use and transportation and education decisions have been made in a context in this country that have deep overlays of racism in them. Our land use code. Our historic land use code, I mean, the way the city looks is literally because of policies around redlining, around covenants. And so our job, and one of the reasons I think that every single neighborhood has to take on affordability, is that it doesn't then mean that the African American community in the central area uh, needs to be taking on all of the density of the community and therefore displacing it. And what I would really love to be in dialogue with this community about is what are the cultural assets? What are the supports that are needed so that people can stay here? Is it different kinds of ownership? Is it rental support? What are those supports? And you only get that answer by actually asking the community themselves. Which Ella did not, I mean, which MHA did not. And so that's it. I do support that. But there's an EIS process right now. And another thing that I support is having council meetings throughout the city. So not always having them at City Hall. What would it be like to have important council meetings on growth and take them to different parts of the community so that people can show up who might be working during the day or may not have transportation. But if part of our job is to truly be in dialogue with the community, and I believe deeply that it is, we need to really change and rethink how we do public process so that people can 
be a part of that dialogue. So you'd be open as a mayor to open meetings. Because we can't contact the actual mayor today. Yeah, I mean, that, that in the age, in this era, yes, absolutely. I mean, as a legislator, that has been my job, and that has been the best part of the job, to be talking with my community about how I can serve them. Yes. I think you voted yes on HB 2201, which is changing the car. Yeah, and so I was curious, just like, I don't know that much about it, so I was curious yeah. why you voted yes on that and what impact you think that's going to have on SD3. Okay. So, HB 2201 was a bill, is a bill that's still alive in Olympia. It, um, the car tab schedule that everybody passed in 2000. 16 in November is based on the 199 valuation model, which is something that has really been found to have out of whack valuation. And so there are two core issues with this bill that I voted yes on. One is as an elected official, it's my job to steward the tax system. And if you're getting taxed on something and it's higher than what it actually is, I have to change that. That's my job. And it might not be easy to do, but I have to do that. The second piece, though, is that there will be a financial hit to Sound Transit, around $700 million, if that happens. And it is also my job to implement the will of the voters who voted on this package and want it delivered. And so it's my job to figure out how we're going to fix that shortfall. There are ways to do that. We can get additional money from the state. We can, you know, I, I can talk a little bit about that. But fundamentally, I have that bill had two important pieces. One, a steward of the tax system. Because if I'm going to ask you for more taxes, you all have to believe that there is integrity to the tax system. At the same time, if we're going to put another ballot initiative on transportation on the ballot, you also have to believe that we're going to deliver on the promises. And so I am committed to both of those things. Uh, Toby Thaler from Fremont. Uh, I'm not going to ask about whether you believe growth is necessary and why you think it's good. Everybody expects me to do that. But I'm going to shift to your statement that the upzoning and the densification to accommodate, in theory, more low-income housing needs to happen citywide. So my question concerns the Gold Coast and the wealthy neighborhoods that are, have not been targeted whatsoever. And the base quest part of the foundation is uh, whether you're familiar with Guylands and Page, the study of congressional behavior at the national level, that demonstrates that basically this country is an oligarchy and the lower income people don't really have any say over policy. So how are you going to actually make up zones happen in the wealthy neighborhoods and not have up zones happen through some kind of neighborhood planning process that displace lower and middle income people? So, Most of us in Fremont and Wallingford can't even buy our own houses. Right, right. and that is a real issue, right? That it's, it, so here's what I deeply believe, that you need social movements that are pushing on government to do the right thing. And as mayor, one of the things that I would really like to do is work with the labor movement and other advocates to help organize around this issue because I believe that most of us believe there's an affordability crisis in this city and that we need to do things differently. And that the only way you get those tough decisions made, I shouldn't say the only way, but often the decisions that are made in the public interest have a strong movement behind them. And so I don't believe that I can walk into City Hall and suddenly change land use patterns throughout the city. I need the help of people in the community to do that. And again, I would argue that it needs to be really specific to the neighborhood. There are some places where we need to really be focusing on ADUs. There are some places where we need to be focusing on three and four story homes because they're great transit, or three and four story apartment buildings because they're great transit assets. And we need to work with the communities to make those plans, but we need people behind politicians to really make sure that those are made in the public interest. And that's something that's really important to me. But can I ask a follow-up on that? Because you say you support MHA, which is a one-size-fits-all and 10 feet to all these different zones. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's one size fits all, and then you're saying that we have to have unique... So I would urge area. you to read the EIS, the draft EIS, if you haven't yet. What is it? Um, because I think that it really lays out two different notions of how to implement that. And I really think, having sat in on a meeting at Ravenna Bryant the other day, where literally the community was looking at street by street, how to accommodate, and, and the, the feeling in that room was not, you know, we hate growth, we don't want people here. It really was, how do we do this in a way that allows us to have 
you know, transportation options that allows us to use the asset that's being built at Roosevelt through light rail, but to do it in a way that preserves the walkability of our neighborhood, the tree canopy, and, and literally they were sitting down together with planners and with a council member to go through what that might look like. And I think that if we can do that throughout the city, we will get to, and, and again, there are going to be people who just don't agree, and it might be that we don't agree on some of the fundamental premises around that. That's possible. But what I also think is that there are ways within the current EIS system or within the current EIS draft to have a dialogue with communities about how we're going to do growth in our city. I think you're missing this Okay, I might be. If you want to clarify, yeah, that's good. It's a table of people yep. is different than your neighborhood engaging. Yeah. And so we're on a bullet train. The EIS is simply the evaluation of the environmental impacts. We've known that they were going to present several alternatives. So that is what the function of the EIS is. It is the process of creating the final maps and the zoning that we all think should have been more done more collectively and not in public forums. That's what we're at, trying to ask if you're supporting. That makes sense. And as a mayoral candidate, I will call for that. I'm several weeks. And I think that there is a really important opportunity to get communities looking at those maps. And public outreach, that means then, needs to be in different languages. It means that meetings need to be held at times of day when people can get there. Um, and it means, you know, having public notices that make sense. You know, a lot of times those public notices are really hard to understand. So I absolutely believe, and I'm going to have an opportunity over the next several weeks to say, let's do public involvement around this. But I really would say that if you look at the draft EIS, there are different ways of getting at the growth. And I would love for communities to weigh in on that. Just, that matters. You're, you're, just, you're avoiding the question. The grand bargain says we're going to upzone everywhere. These are the rules, okay? And you're saying maybe those rules can be broken. So do you either support the MHA? So I do support the grand bargain, but it does not say that upzoning is going to happen everywhere. I mean, that's it. It, 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 it talks about within the but urban it does villages. in certain places. That right. is true. So you so you support the MHA? You support the grand bargain as a baseline, and you're not going to violate any of that? No, of course not. There are opportunities to actually put in more affordable housing through this draft EIS process. Yeah, we you're should do that. Wrong. The grand bargain specifically in the mayor that, in the letter that was written said all areas within urban villages will be upzoned by at least ten feet, and all single family will convert to low rise one. That is the grand bargain. So that is the grand bargain. And in, in that sense, so to the extent, the so, so what I would say, say. <laughs> I will be careful what I say. I do support the grand bargain. I will just say that. And I know that that's not the answer that you want. But I also know that there is now a process that is in place that literally, and I saw it happen, where neighbors are sitting down with council members and going over how they are going to accommodate growth. So would and you how are they postpone going to implementation? That? Say that again. Would you postpone an ordinance that implements the grand bargain until those neighborhood by neighborhood processes occur? I would say get involved now. There is a draft We've been EIS involved. process. Yeah. Yeah. I hear that. I hear that. And what I would say, in, in, and what I would say to you is that I will also be calling for the council and the mayor to have an open process around the draft EIS. A so I may not, I, you know, but I, I have to be authentic. So there you go. My question. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, All right. We got we have uh, several people. So yes. We need to move a little faster. Okay. Yes. All right. Uh, personal detail. I lived in New York City. I was in a place that was rescued by the city with public funds. When they decided they were going to exit, we organized ourselves, we got ourselves included on risk stabilization in New York City. It allowed me to have a very enjoyable life in New York City for the remainder of the 17 years I was there. So, a uh, lot of politicians, when I ask them about risk stabilization, they go, it doesn't work. I don't know much about logic, that's the third line of a syllogism. What are the other two parts, if you believe that, and if you call what we're doing now working, we are in serious trouble. Yeah, so. The HALA committee, as undemocratic as it was, as uh, with the assistance of some type of consensus, which is beyond even the Robbins Rules of Order, unless you have some major policy piece going on within a committee, said, well, we're not going to say this to the city unless it's consensus. They still voted 13 to 11 to ask the state, you want a tool, no charge, no funds from the state, just drop the restriction on the rent stabilization laws. Just do that. That's a one-line law. 
We need a lot of education needs to be led by the mayor. We need to reach out to other municipalities. We need to educate people across the state. We're doing wonderful things, I guess, with some presidential uh, leader. What are we going to do just in the state to educate our citizens? 54% of the people who live in Seattle are renters. The okay. question is, do you or do you not support the state rescinding that law? I do, and I have publicly advocated that as a legislator. And there are places in the world like Berlin where you can do rent stabilization. There's a lot of nuance. There are some methods, I think, that don't work as well. But we need to have all the tools on the table <coughs> to solve the affordability crisis. Hi, this is Jan Brucker from Lincoln Springs. Uh, I want to ask you, um, would you support, either within the housing levy or some other mechanism, uh, essentially a, a slowdown or a moratorium on development to allow that community conversation? Uh, we all participated, most of us have participated in neighborhood planning uh, 20 years ago. Those plans are still viable. Most communities had at least 300 people in the community <coughs> attending their meeting. So my, my, uh, my specific question is, rather than tear down and rebuild, how uh, would you or would you support um, the eight and six unit brick apartment buildings remaining in place? They are um, uh, characteristic of Seattle's first wave of development. They're still valuable as assets. Would you uh, support something like transfer of air rights so that those buildings can remain in place and remain affordable? So I would say that's a, that's a really interesting nuance around transfer of air rights. And so I would say I, I, I'm not going to support a moratorium on development. I mean, we need to continue to accommodate the growth that is happening. But are there interesting ideas like that where we're able to preserve some buildings that have a cultural element to them? At the same time, there are going to be other places where we need to have higher, denser buildings. And I think that, um, you know, I can't, without knowing which buildings you're talking about and what parts of the community, that matters. But, but there are places where I think those small, you know, those older buildings could be preserved. But then we have to do it, and, and that's where my notion of community planning comes from, which is, okay, everybody's going to take on some affordability. Let's figure out how we're going to do it. And I think that we do, we have to have that, you know, we're going to have to build the plane while it's flying on the issue of growth, because the growth is already happening. Okay. What, what, I'm sorry, we, we've run out of time. Oh, one minute, two minutes. Sorry? One minute, 30 seconds. Oh, on the 24 minutes? Yeah. Okay, all right, very good, sorry. Okay. Sorry. Uh, my name is Christine Lee, and I currently live in Northgate, but I cut my teeth in uh, activism and land use in South Lake Union. And I, you keep talking about community dialogue. Okay, I really want to get to the kernel of that because Vulcan was very the pr principal player in South Lake Union. And they were very uh, sophisticated in terms of how they uh, perpetrated that land grab, which it was. South Lake Union is not a neighborhood, it's a development. It will always be a development, it will never be a, 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 um, a neighborhood. And here's why. Because, yes, many, many people, uh, renters, homeowners, uh, uh, businesses came together and really were involved in the, thought they were involved in the forming and shaping of that community. The fact was Vulcan is so sophisticated, as all other developers are, in just creating this environment of, oh yeah, we're, we're all, a, we're a team, and it's just checking the box. They go ahead, they have the money and the power to do whatever the hell they want. So I want to know, as mayor, how will you actually dig down, drill down, and make these experiences not just a ch box checking the box, right. but meaningful. Me not meaningful results? Results. Good. That's okay. My so one of the things that I would ask all of you to do is to look at each candidate's history and track record. And I'm going to talk a little bit about a planning process that I was a part of at Pierce Transit. So Pierce Transit, during the recession in Pierce County, I lived in Tacoma, um, was having to cut 30% of its service. And for a transit-dependent community, that is a major blow. So we created a community uh, outreach and dialogue plan that was very, very significant and results-oriented. We worked with the bus operators because they know their customers best. We talked to 
customers over and over again. We talked to employers, we talked to service providers, and literally when you're cutting that much service, it came down to which runs over the course of the day. Is a 6.50 a.m. ride better than a 7.30 a.m. ride, and why? Which stops do we need to say? And we had to ask the community, is it better to preserve that stop at the hospital, or is it better to preserve that stop at the preschool close by? And so you only do that by having a public outreach strategy that is very, very, very robust and relies on the people who know best. In this case, a lot of it was through bus operators and the people who actually took the bus. And we spent a lot of time asking them. And the result was, usually a service cut like that is just a big peanut butter. The suburbs and the center city all take the same cut. We instead did a politically difficult thing in that county and cut service, preserving as much as we could in the low-income transit-dependent parts of the, of the community. And that was a political decision by elected officials. And so I can only say that there are times when you can have a robust, true dialogue. I mean, we had plans that we made, and there were ideas that we put on the table that the public did not want and would not use, and we adjusted those. Where is Wilkins money going in this election? Not to me. You know where? You'll have to ask the next candidates as they come. Yes. Okay. All right. So I am deeply appreciative of all of you being here. We may not agree on every issue around housing and growth, um, but I do believe that we all know that we're all in this together and that the only way we are going to make progress on affordability, on the homelessness crisis, on transportation, on funding our public schools is by getting down to work. And I have the history and background in advocacy and as a legislator of really doing that, whether it is delivering on Sound Transit 3 and affordable housing, whether it is passing some of the strongest oil transportation safety laws through a Republican Senate, whether it is furthering pregnant worker protection, again, through that same Republican Senate. I really am the candidate in this race that has the experience and the values that we share as people who truly love this community. And I also have that background in activism. I know what it means to go up against a bureaucracy, be frustrated about it, and then organize. And as I said earlier, the only way we get big things done is not only having the right people in the right places, but having the social movements behind us. And that's where I believe, as a person who has relationships with neighborhoods, with the labor movement, with the environmental community, and with others, that is how, with the Democratic Party, with others, that is really and truly how we get the political will to do difficult things around solving some of these major issues. So I would love your support. I'm happy to stick around and hear the hard questions. Um, and again, I just appreciate your time today. Thank you.